Thank you, Brother Frank. That was very, very good. And, and I agree with him very much, too, is how much I appreciate our choir. And we have a lot coming up here very recently. We have a lot coming up uh, as we start thinking about Christmas and we start thinking about uh, what we have as holidays. But I, I almost resist saying that today because some want to call it a holiday as well and just forget about the Christmas of and, and especially the Christ of Christmas. But what a blessing we have. And I want to say what a joy it is to be with you today. Uh, I, you know, have told you before, I appreciate your patience in that, is that I have commitments because of what I do. I made a year ago, and some of those have just crept up again that I had forgotten about and didn't mark them. And I get these phone calls saying, you, you promised. Uh, so I know even next week I'll be at Chief Cornerstone in Mayfield. Uh, this is Veterans Day. Tonight I'll be speaking at uh, Potter's House on Veterans Day celebration. And then this Thursday we've got our breakfast here. And uh, I have to be in Hopkinsville Thursday, but I'm still going to swing by here and spend some time as well too. I want to say how much I appreciate churches that celebrate Veterans Day. There are a lot of folks today that want to separate out anything like that as though it's not godly or something, when in fact, I think we ought to celebrate all kinds of work. Uh, being in the military is a part of patriotism uh, and, and such, and I have no resistance to celebrating that. I'm very patriotic. And yet at the same time, I think it is Jesus who will ultimately bring peace. Uh, matter of fact, in Zechariah, he even talks about that, that one day that Israel being in turmoil will be only settled when the king of kings comes and he sets up his reign and rule on the earth and that sin is passed away and is no more. Until then, though, we worship, we pray, we work. And we do the work that God has called us to do. So I want to say how much I appreciate each of you and your faithfulness. And even in encouraging you as I talk about the bulletin, that you take that thing and give it to somebody. Encourage them. Invite them to church. But do more than that. If you have to encourage them more, say, I'll swing by and pick you up. Uh, and I remember in the years I've worked secularly, uh, and I'm including in military in that, the years I was in, I had some of the most fruitful times in the most inopportune ways. And a lot of times it was just handing out a bulletin to somebody and say, look at all the exciting things we're doing. Uh, we sure would like to see you come join us. Uh, matter of fact, I had in one unit, uh, Terry and I, when we were over in Hawaii, I had in one unit, I had 15 in the unit I was in. It was a canine corps. And out of that, I had 14 of them come to Christ in about 18 months. I never went and buttonholed anybody. Uh, they came to me. They would talk to me at times because they would call me, you're one of them holy guys. And I'm going, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, I am sure of this, though, is that Jesus Christ has the help you need. He is the help you need. Look at Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. Watch the snare. Now, the years I, I served in combat, one of the first things they always teach you about is not just how to fire a weapon in combat or in war, but how to avoid traps. Because there were all kinds of traps. They had uh, different, uh, you know, the punji sticks. Uh, they were always dipped in poison. So it wasn't that they would just get your foot. Uh, they would poison your body and end up killing you. And uh, I, I know at times they would have all these unique ways of just killing. And it was terrible. We, we've heard a lot of that recently, haven't we? Uh, we've seen that with Hamas and some of the things they're doing. F folks today really amaze me in this way. And I know there's a bigger argument. And they want to make that. Okay, make it. I haven't heard it yet. But it's a bigger argument that it's okay to chop a baby's head off and to do those kind of things. That's sick. That's, that's absolutely sick. And when people celebrate that, ugliness haps, happens in war. And it is whenever you and I feel afraid of something or intimidated by something that it stops us doing what God has called us to do. 
Now, as I look at the text today, I'm going to read here verses 1 to 14. But in that, I want you to pay attention to Nehemiah, the things that he was being confronted with, and the way that he would handle that. Because what I want to get you back to is, how do you and I apply what we see here, and how does it help us as we try to live in a world today that's filled with snaps, uh, with snaps, with snares and traps. Snaps, I guess, would be the cheaper way of saying uh, snares and traps. But uh, we find snares and traps all around us. Think of that as we read this. When Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that no gap was left in it. Though at that time I had not installed the doors in the city gates. Sanballat and Geshem sent me a message. Come, let's meet together in the villages of Ono Valley. Isn't that interesting? They were planning to harm me. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing important work and cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same proposal, and I gave them the same reply. Now, this is just messages coming. Now, notice how it changes. Sanballat sent me this same message a fifth time by his aide, who had an open letter in his hand. And it was written, it is reported. I always love that. Somebody said, I heard. Heard from whom? It is reported among the nations. And Geshem agrees with me. <laughs> Why wouldn't he? I mean, he's on the other side anyway, isn't he? That you and the Jews plan to rebel. This is the reason you are rebuilding the wall. According to these reports, you are to become their king and have even set up the prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim on your behalf. There is a king in Judah. This is what they're saying. There is a king in Judah. These rumors will be heard by the king. So come, let's confer together. Let's, let's get together and let's negotiate this thing. Then, he, then I replied to him, there is nothing to these rumors. You are spreading. Notice what he put. I mean, he put it right back on him saying, you are the one spreading these. You are inventing them in your own mind. For they were all trying to intimidate us and saying they will drop their hands from the work and it will never be finished. But now my God strengthened my hands. What a prayer in the midst of that. I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, son of, that's me, to, I got to figure out how to say some of these, uh, Mia to, to Bell. Uh, I could read that in Hebrew better than I can English. Who was restricted to his house, he said. Let's meet at the house of God inside the temple. Let's shut the temple doors because they are coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you tonight. But I said, should a man like me run away? How can someone like me enter the temple and live? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him because of the prophecy he spoke against me. Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was hired so that I would be intimidated. There's that word again. And do as he suggested. Sin and get a bad reputation. In order that they would discredit me. Now his prayer. My God. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, the ones who paid the prophet to lie, for what they have done, and also for the prophetess Noadiah and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. Father, we know that there are snares in life that catch our attention. Sometimes it's to be popular when you're in school or at work and in life. Sometimes it's being included with others and not risking 
being pushed away. Sometimes it's while we're doing a job, people will tell us to live in the real world because church and faith are not that world. Father, you have told us differently. And you have given us a whole different set of rules, even as I think about the teachings on the mount in Matthew 6. When he tells us to seek things above and seek your kingdom first. And all these things that we need and desire will be added to us. Father, I thank you for these that are here this morning. Open our eyes. Be our teacher. Be our guide as we study your word together in Jesus' name. So what we find here is the wall is all but finished with the doors to be hung. And we find that the enemy has got now desperate. You ever notice how it is if in life, sometimes when somebody does good, I've seen this and I felt it and I bet you have as well, is that when somebody really does good, they want to know how they got there. Do you know that the study in America is that the average high school student that was surveyed at that particular time believed the only way you could get wealthy in society was by cheating, stealing, and doing underhanded things, living in the real world. That's sad, isn't it? That's absolutely terrible. I heard somebody uh, not too long ago had said to me, that they felt the problem in our world today is capitalism and that socialism is much better. And I said, you don't have a job yet, do you? And they said, well, not yet. I said, it be interesting whenever you get a job because if what you're asking for is true, you don't get hardly any of your money. Somebody else is going to get that because you're working for everybody else and not yourself. The thing I like about capitalism is the bad of it is we get greedy. But the good of it is, is that there is a reward of effort and work. It requires some. You can't just sit at home and get it. you got to go gain it by being profitable. Matter of fact, the Bible is very uh, explicit on this, that it is good to work with your hands. God has made us that way. And that you and I are to be busy about things and not looking to just blame everyone else for why we don't have better or more. What I find here is quite interesting, though. They try to use a various set of things, fear and intimidation. They try to use that repeatedly. How does the world teach us to deal with fear and intimidation? Most of the time, the world is going to teach you to deal with fear and intimidation by ignoring it. You got your head in the sand. I talk to people whenever everything in their life was falling apart. And it's not their faith in Christ. Sometimes it's just pure denial. Because I'm here to tell you, even though I knew my dad went to heaven, I've held the hands of men that were dying as the blood leaked out of their bodies. And I've held that hand, looked in their eye. And let me tell you something, there was fear there. There was that aspect of it, looking at it. And I still had to question, like, why? Why, Lord? And yet, in the midst of all of that, no matter how much we believe, Satan knows where you're weak. Fear, intimidation. For some, it's about finances. And the risk of that would cause us to do all kinds of things, even potentially to compromise our faith in Christ. And here they're looking for the weakness in uh, Nehemiah. And they're focusing on him because it, they know if he goes down, the entire operation goes down. The same thing I've seen in families where Fathers have been absent. And because they are absent and disengaged completely, sometimes they're divorced, sometimes they're not. They're just disengaged. And I've seen that at times to where it breaks down the entire family because Satan goes after the one that has been held responsible. I still believe biblically and scripturally, and this is nothing against women because we're finding a day and time that I've told many a men uh, when I've done marital counseling, that if you don't straighten up, uh, she was impressed with you whenever 
you were dating because you actually took a bath and you got that fish and hunting smell off of you and, uh, and then you took her out. But now that you're married, you can smell like a fish, a dead fish all the time, or you can look like you're out in the middle of the woods uh, in, in a hunting incident of some sort, or golf, all of your free times with others. And in the midst of all that, there's no time for the family. Satan uses that to destroy families all the time. You know why? Because a wife, many times in our day and time, she can get a better job than you can. And as a result of that, she don't need you anymore. And in fact, the family's not based upon who needs whom. It's based upon the idea that we have covenanted together to work together, to be in covenant relationship. That's more than a partnership. That's it. We are both invested in it physically, emotionally, spiritually, and always we are partners in this together. Ignore it. Another one is deny it. I've been in places at times where they say, oh, no, it's, it's nice. There's nothing going on. I, I've done conflict resolution for churches many years. And, and it's interesting that when we can't admit that there is a problem. Problems do exist in churches, relationships. It doesn't have to be widespread. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just between a few couples or individuals in a church like that. The best way to get over it is to admit it and to approach it and to deal with it. But we tend to ignore it, deny it, or avoid it. We leave. We just leave and we'll go somewhere else and we'll pretend like there's another church down the road that doesn't have problems. It may be when we show up, they start having problems. I don't know. I'm not going to blame that person who does that. I'm just saying the world is not perfect yet. So as I look at what Nehemiah approached it here, I've got it broken down in three things to kind of help make sense out of it. Verses 5 through 9. What was the snare? Verses 5 through 9. And you look at those verses and he starts saying here that Sanballat sent me this message a fifth time. The message was, come and meet with us. And, and if we're going to meet together, uh, we can work this out. Well, I didn't mean five through it's, it's one through four. As you begin to look at this, because the first snare is the invite. They'll invite you to Ono Valley. I mean, it's unique that it's called Ono in this way because... Oh, no, don't go that way. Get invited to that. How many times in high school have you been invited to a party that you know you shouldn't go to? How many times as a worker you've been invited out? When I was, uh, again, military, <clears throat> I, I was the operations sergeant. I was the second guy down from the commander. And I set up all the NCO training, uh, all the enlisted training for the non-commissioned officers. And I would set that up. And you know where they used to have that training before I got into that position? They had it at happy hour over at the NCO club. Now, let me tell you, there was no training going over there. There was a whole lot of drinking and partying and drunkenness. And out of that, I moved everything back into a training room. And my comment to the first sergeant whenever he came to me and complaining because he was an alcoholic. And I said to him, Top, I said, here's what you need to understand. Training is for training, not for drinking. You're not training the young guys to be a drunk. He didn't like my comment, and it probably didn't help me advance too much uh, in his eyes. But the reality of it was, that was true, uh, is I don't feel the obligation of teaching them how to sin. I think that comes natural enough. Mine was to teach them to be a better worker, a better NCO, a better leader in the midst of that. But the invite is, come and join us. This is more fun. Come and join, uh, and join us because you'll like this more. One guy would always ask me on Monday morning when I'd go up and he'd say, well, what'd you do all weekend? And I'd say, you won't believe it. This weekend we broke the mold. And they go, really? What was that? Because he knew I went to church. And I said, I went to church twice. It was crazy. We went Saturday and Sunday. We had so much fun on Saturday, we went back on Sunday. And I'd always point my finger at him and I'd say, here's the reality of it too. I know where I've been, I know what I've done, and I know how much money I have. And I feel good. 
So what we do a lot of times is we make it look like the life that we live as believers is below standard. That it's all pietism. And we all walk around. I start to say we all walk around with a frown on our face. Well, we tend to do that quite a bit, maybe too much. But we don't know how to have enjoyment in where we are. He's trying to tempt him and saying, you'll have better fun over here and we'll all work together. But down in, uh, in that, you see this, what is the snare here is that he is trying to work on him in such a way that he can get him distracted to invite him into something. And that is a big, big snare for many of us, the invitation to go do something we know God doesn't want us to do. What is Nehemiah's response? He said here, whenever he told him that they even knew that they were planning to harm him, that he would not go. That the work of God is more important and more valuable to not just the work and not just to God, but to he himself. Snare number two is reputation. Look at the reputation he's working on. The first one is invitation. The second one, reputation. And reputation is verses 5 through 9. And in verses 5 through 9, Sanballat sent him a fifth message. This time, when it's called an open letter, he needs a response. And it was exposed in such a way that others could see it. And that's the message. It is reported. Reputation. Reputation is whenever Satan attacks you for what is good. And this is what I, I despise hearing this. Well, they said, and I'm going to say, when somebody in church comes to me and says, well, somebody has said, well, tell me who somebody is. Well, I can't do that. Well, then don't tell me. I don't want to hear it. I've gotten letters at times because of my, I don't know what it is. I call it my gentle, kind way of communicating. And as a result of that, I've gotten anonymous letters at times. And, and I, I, one of them I got and I shredded it and I brought the shreds back to the pulpit. And I said, if you don't sign it, it don't get read. And I threw it in a trash can. Then after about three of those, I brought it to the entire church body because I do believe this. If you turn the light on darkness, it dispels darkness. And I wanted to shed light on this. And I said, I want you to get what I got. And I began to start reading it. And I got down to some interesting pieces and I left off some. And I said, you don't need to read, hear the rest of this. And I just wadded it up. And I said, because it's anonymous, it's useless. And if you got the guts, why don't you come to my office anytime and you let me know. I'll be there. And I'm not talking about fighting anybody. I'm talking about just, if you got the guts, come and tell me what it is. Stop telling that somebody else said Others have said, because there's always going to be room for gossip. There always is. No matter what we do here in all the list of activities, some say, well, I don't see any need for that. Why are they going to that? Uh, I remember one time my grandfather was doing the same thing. I probably told you this, but my grandfather, we're riding down the road on a Wednesday night coming back because my mother was driving us and... Uh, and, and as we're coming back from church, my grandparent, uh, one of them's in the front seat, my brother and I and my grandpa are in the back seat. And, and he said, well, you saw what happened tonight, didn't you? Business meeting. And my grandmother said, no, tell us what happened tonight, Lee. And he said, well, and mentioned the guy's name. He got all the jobs again. He gonna run that church. And it'll be his before too long. My grandmother said one thing. She said, well, Lee, which one of those jobs do you want? And he said, I don't want any of them. She said, then shut up. <laughs> We're all sitting back there. My grandpa is my hero. He's only about five foot four. He is my hero. But when I heard that, I went, whoa. <laughs> and I looked at his face, got red, but he said nothing else. He knew she was right. Others want to complain about a problem and assign it to you. Well, here's what the youth would be doing. Here's what the children would be doing. Here's what our audio video would be doing. Or here's what our choir and music or 
any of the other things that we do in church and leadership areas like that. But those who want to complain and not make it better have no voice. The reality of it is we are not to be so concerned about our reputation, to smear our reputation. Be responsible like here you find Nehemiah whenever he says, as it is reported, and he heard that, he said, there is nothing to these rumors you are spreading. He put it right back on them. That's what we need to be able to do at times. You don't have to say it like I would say it. Well, you're the ones creating the problems. You might want to say it more nicely or gentle. That's your problem, uh, not mine. But mine is I, I just tell somebody what I think, and I don't always win friends doing that. Uh, but I'm not as interested in winning a friend or a favor whenever it's somebody just wanting to smear and smudge and do. Nehemiah's response could be something you and I have. But now, my God, strengthen my hands. What is he saying there? After he hears all this, he puts it back on them and says, I'm not giving in to it. I'm not going to do that. And he said, here, but now, my God, strengthen my hands. He went to prayer not reputation. Thirdly and lastly here, consecration. Consecration. Why do I use that word? Look at what is trying to happen now. They have paid off a prophetess. And these prophets in Jerusalem, those that were declaring themselves to be that, and they were coming to him and saying, you need to do this. So they're using godly things to try to bring guilt on somebody and to say, you need to run and you need to hide and you need to be safe. Take care of yourself. We live in a rough world, so just take care of yourself. Don't worry about anybody else. Uh, my friend, we don't live in isolation. We have to live together. But consecration is they were inviting him into the house of God, into the temple, and to live there. And he said, I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him a sense of spiritual insight because of the prophecy he spoke against me. In other words, Nehemiah knew so well what God wanted him to do when somebody told him to do otherwise. He knew better. He knew better. I was challenged. Many of you have been challenged at work that here's how to get ahead. If you hang out with this crowd, if you do what they do, if you act the way they do, whether you're young or old, that's the enticement. But I also know this. Consecration is important because I was more interested in my character not my reputation. My character, when my dad died, I was then concerned about something, very concerned. I was concerned about the idea that I wouldn't bring shame on my name or upon his name. It changed a lot of my behavior. And as I began to pray to God, I wasn't praying to my dad, I was praying to God, and I was asking him for strength. But when people would entice me, things that I before probably would have done, I said, not now, not now. It changed my behaviors in the military where it's very secular, very much a godless area in many ways. And yet there are opportunities to share God and live for him. But it wasn't easy. It's tough. I'd say having a job in a plant, a job in construction, a job in some of these other areas the same way. They entice you. They pull you. They try to work against you in all sorts of ways. And in here, I like the very fact that in consecration, he knew what the snare was. He recognized it. Public sin is that he would disobey God from doing the work and hide in the temple. That's sin. My friend, even though I've advertised it, I'm retiring December the 31 from Kentucky Baptist Convention. I'm not retiring from ministry. I'm not retiring from preaching. Not retiring from what God has called me to do. I know God called me to do that. 
And in the midst of that, it's answering, addressing that, living to know what God has said and wants is that I won't give into that and I won't give into the weakness of getting tired of being exposed to this constant beratement. Nehemiah's response, look in verse 14 of this chapter. My God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat. My friend, that's, that's not a prayer of comfort. That's a prayer of judgment. God bring judgment on them because they're using you as a sheet of righteousness when in fact they are stained with sin. And now remember them for what they have done, their evil deeds. And all the prophetess Noadiah and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. Look at just the sentence above that even here when he talks about in verse 13. He was hired so that I would be intimidated, do as he suggested, sin, and get a bad reputation. He would lose his entire credibility. Here's what I was talking about earlier. Reputation is one thing. Character is another. I look at a man's character long before I do his reputation. Some people that tell, they'll say, well, this about them. Well, this is the kind of person they are. And I'm going, wow, really? You know, I've, I've had some people describe uh, people in churches. I'm not trying to be specific about it, but just in churches to say, oh, he's a troublemaker. I said, why is he a troublemaker? Well, he's always asking questions. I'm going, my kind of guy. You know, I don't see that as a troublemaker. Uh, what are we looking at here? Sometimes the reason they're calling them problems is they're too much like me or I'm too much like that. And I'm going, well, I can get along with a guy like that pretty easy because he's going to tell me what he thinks. The process this, though, in your character is what matters. And that's whenever all the lights are out and all of the eyes are away. You do what is right. No matter what others are saying or doing, you do what is right. And so I'm telling you, friend, in the world we live in today, that will sometimes create conflict. But I would rather have conflict with the world any time than I would with my Savior. I would rather have conflict with others in society than to lose my character and have a bad conscience constantly. It would plague me. My friend, there's some who deal with that over and over and over, and they repeat the same sins. I think God is teaching us as he causes us at times to be exposed. You ever seen yourself do that? Whenever you make a bad choice and then you, have, you get exposed to that same thing again, and you got to make a choice, and maybe a bad one, and then you come back to it again, and God is teaching us to eventually consecrate ourselves to live for him. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes if you would. And I'm going to say to all of you that are here and those that are listening, if you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, works will not get you to heaven. What I've been preaching this morning are about Nehemiah and how he lived for God as a believer in Yahweh. He was a believer in God and his plan. You and I, in God's plan, it's this, that Jesus died on a cross. He was buried. And on the third day, he arose. And if we ask him with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. My friend, before you need to live for Christ, you need to be saved by Christ. Believe in him. Trust him. Know him. If you don't know that, if you haven't ever done that, do it right now. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, all you've got to do is understand that and say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm lost. You've revealed that to me. And I want to trust you as Savior. It's that simple. Just do that. And my friend, if you're one of these that has been concerned, hurt, troubled, 
like we talked about this morning. If Satan is inviting you and you need to rebel against that, do it today. You don't have to do it in the altar. That would help it. But you can do it right where you sit. And you say, Lord, I know I failed. And I ask you to forgive me. And to restore your joy. Thank you for being part of our service today. Our prayer at Zion's Cause is that this service drew you closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. We look forward to you joining us again next week. On behalf of the pastor, staff, and congregation. May God richly bless you and keep you.